as, as we shift gears here, we're going to continue the discussion about farm and what it means to digital. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion, and, and hopefully somebody will be joining me on stage. If not, you know, I'll be there by myself, so uh, just be kind. Uh, but anyway, I, I think um, we're just waiting to get everybody else up online. But as we look at that, I, I, what I see is going to be really interesting to me is looking at the, the, the pharmaceutical companies that have actually gotten into it so far. And if you take a look, you know, which ones are forming only through partnerships versus are really building in-house, you know, uh, their own in-house digital platforms. You know, it's, it's interesting to look at the, in, the individual companies and you kind of get a sense of their culture as a, as, a, as a pharmaceutical company and then the way they're looking at the marketplace. So hopefully with this group, we'll be able to dig in a little bit deeper and understand from them, you know, how their companies are viewing uh, digital healthcare from a pharmaceutical lens. So with that, Oh, here we go. Well, why don't we do this to, to kind of kick this off. I think it would be great is if each person could go through and just introduce yourself um, and then tell us a little bit about how your organization perceives digital health in terms of a pharmaceutical, um, from, a, from a pharmaceutical lens. So if you want to begin, that'd be great. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Uh, Thank you. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Doug Lee, I'm with uh, uh, Bayer Pharma, and I lead... Um, digital and data science partnerships uh, globally. Um, I guess in that context, I do investments, acquisitions, and uh, development and commercialization agreements of all kinds. Um, background is um, big and small companies, venture capital, and investment banking. Um, and I came to buyer a couple years ago from Samsung, where I led strategy and corp dev. Great. Next, Josh, if you don't mind going, that'd be great. No, uh, can you hear me, everyone? Yeah. Ah, perfect. All right. Hey, Joe. Uh, hey, Doug. Um, so my name is Josh Raisman. Um, I'm apologies in advance for not being able to be there with you in person. I lead the Digital Innovation Lab at Pfizer. Um, the focus of our lab is more or less emblematic of where we believe the most profound opportunity is for, for digital and digital health, um, whether it's digital mechan mechanisms for expanding our scientific knowledge and uh, leading to the identification of, of novel therapeutics, the ability to uh, design studies or recruit faster to accelerate our ability to, to bring those developments into uh, the marketplace as effective medicines. Um, but overall, to, to accompany the patient and, and often the provider um, across the treatment journey, whether that's uh, you know, with the idea that um, along the way we can enhance outcomes and, and certainly enhance the experience, whether that's um, sort of the more traditional sort of lighter weight digital health companions um, or uh, into the, the more clinically validated and often regulated world of biomarkers, digital diagnostics, and, and digital medicines. Um, and just like any other organization, we're constantly looking at digital to make our lives uh, or our work faster and easier, allowing us to invest more time in those high value opportunities. Uh, looking forward to today's discussion. Great, thank you. So next uh, is... Um making sure I think we're missing one person. So Steve or David, if you want to go next, that'd be great. Sure. Is, uh, is, is David here as well uh, just yet? No, I, that's what I don't know. He's not here yet. Okay. Getting, okay. I'm getting the high sign from the, uh, from the AV guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, yeah, I'll go in the meantime. I'm uh, Steve Peretz uh, with AppNovation, and I lead uh, digital product strategy for the health vertical. Um, and so agency side, uh, not directly with pharma, but we work with a lot of big pharma companies, um, as well as payer and provider. Um, and across the board in the whole industry, uh, at least for the last two years, uh, what digital has meant for the different organizations is a way to deliver um, meaningful value across the patient journey. So really echoing a lot of what Josh uh, just said about the patient journey, but also that concept um, of looking at you know, something that's digital health all the way to DTX, because not everything is DTX. And um, I think that'll actually be a pretty important thing to, to talk about. I'd, I'd be curious to hear how, how you explain it, Josh, as we get going here. Um, but la lastly, uh, for AppNovation, basically, uh, simply put, for us, digital is the opportunity to help people. Um, and um, you know, with digital comes data and the opportunity to demonstrate how we're delivering meaningful value to patients, caregivers, and, and sometimes HCPs as well. Great, thank you. Well, so as we dive into this a little bit, 
um, deeper, what I'd like is, you know, maybe Steve, you can take this question and maybe uh, Doug, you can, you can kind of follow up on it and give us your perspective as well. But, you know, as we look at um, ways pharmaceutical companies can create uh, meaningful partnerships with advocacy and technology partners, um, how, how does that help advance the digital uh, therapeutic strategies that, that we've been talking about over this first day here? Yeah, I mean, from my experience, and I think Doug's coming from, you know, pharma side is, is going to hopefully be different or, or complementary. Um, par partnerships actually have been really critical to, to advance that success. So there's, like, like mentioned in the question, you know, technology, but also advocacy partners. Um, and if we look at DTX first, I think um, I'd want to lead just with the experience of what, what's worked well and what hasn't. Um, and you know there was an example where there was a DTX partner that was being evaluated by a big pharma company, and um, there were a lot of really great uh, potential for it. There was content partnership, um, you know, same set of of users, you know, the, the patients and caregivers affected by a specific condition, um, same markets, uh, some excitement around features that could potentially be leveraged and. The, the reason I bring up all of those things, it sounds really exciting, but it was, it was almost a curse for the first few months because I'm sure a lot of people have experienced, you know, the stigma is that pharma can't move fast. So sometimes when the ambitions are really, really high and you might want to put something in clinical trials or, you know, prove meaningful outcomes, that, that might be a one, two, three year roadmap. So in this specific case that I'm bringing up, um, the learning after a couple months of, of meetings and meetings and meetings was, you know, don't boil the ocean. Um, so the success that was found was, it sounds simple, but it really was what ignited everything was um, just start with a basic uh, tech integration. So it was an API integration between the digital therapeutic and the, you know, big leading pharmaceutical organization. Just get these guys talking together, um, demonstrate that there's a, a great integration and then everyone was happy because we actually had a proven success story of how something is working. And then from there, we were able to build and build and build and, and define a clear roadmap. Um, so I'll just kind of pause there. And Doug, I think maybe if you want to continue on that or have a different stream about some of the success you're seeing, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, I'm just coming from a, a, a dip, maybe different point of view. Um, so I, I have the great luxury of going across pharma. And so we look at generally at... Uh, three buckets of opportunity. Um, one is uh, opportunities in the pipeline. So everything from preclinical pre to registration to beyond. Um, at the front end of that, there's a lot of computational bio. There's digital biomarkers. Um, there's a lot of evidence strategies that we move into the clinic, uh, de decentralized trials, et cetera. Uh, and then we try to extend that to the payer side. So we have uh, a lot of rich activity sort of around the pipeline. And then we also look at um, separately um, opportunities that are adjacent to the pipeline. So really, I would call that tech with medicines. And so uh, sometimes those are measurement technologies. We'll take an RPM technology and, and you know, introduce it into one of our studies, and we're using it primarily as a measurement uh, tool. Um, if we validated it on the R&D side, a lot of times we'll move it into the commercial uh, uh, setting where we're going to use it to, for, to identify patients and get people into our franchises and our brands. Um, the last group of uh, opportunities we look at are standalone digital opportunities. And you know, these are things that um, Livongo S models. So they're, they're things where there's a slick, user, uh, slick user interface, there's uh, RWD uh, data, the PRO data that's introduced uh, through the devices. And we're trying to put it basically a higher therapeutic standard on those to bring them into uh, the pharma context. Now, when we look at all of these, um, you know, we're, we're not a software company, we're not a technology company. So the way we think about the business is not uh, to, to really convene these ecosystems. We look at these ecosystems as, as places where we can facilitate, facilitate value on that. So we bring um, our ecosystem, which has been around for 150 years, and we introduce that, you know, on top of, of these ecosystems. So maybe it's bringing stakeholders to the game, maybe it's bringing uh, our business models, the, the way we capture data, the way we manage data, uh, et cetera, um, those, those, those sorts of things. So hopefully that answers. 
No, so, you, you know, know, what's interesting is uh, listening to both your perspectives brings a question to the forefront, and I think, Steve, you alluded to it. Pharmaceuticals traditionally take a, a much longer-term viewpoint as they approach any project, right? So they're looking at where do we need to be in five years, potentially, right? When you partner with the smaller startup digital therapeutic companies that are in this room, <laughs> You know, oftentimes it's a much shorter timeline, right? So they're looking at they're, they're they're looking at the first year, then the second year. Maybe they get to a three-year time horizon. So as you're bringing the two organizations together from a partnership, what are some of the challenges that that maybe you've seen or that you you know would would potentially expect in that partnership? Um, and then also maybe Doug, you can kind of share what are ways that you can kind of mitigate those challenges and come to a successful partnership. So Steve, if you want to start. Yeah. Um, so. I think with App Innovation, we try to bridge the gap of a culture clash. Um, and it was even talked about a little bit in the, in the um, previous session where, you know, pharmaceutical, the, the way it's set up, there's a long, long roadmap and pipeline and, you know, waterfall approach historically, whereas digital therapeutics, something that, you know, used to take a long time to achieve, you're looking at how to accelerate that. Um, but with that comes some challenges where a lot of digital therapeutic Companies aren't necessarily set up to have a year and a half of meetings before something gets done. They're just, they operate too lean. Um, or, or they weren't well prepared to understand the, the nature of how to navigate with pharmaceutical company. And then on the, on the flip side, just the pharma company having a level of empathy and, and transparency to, to, um, to understand early on what it is that they're really looking for. Um, because it's, it's just not easy to, to just constantly pivot and change direction. So, um, yeah, I think solving that culture is a very big deal. And, and the biggest success that I've seen from the, the biggest pharmaceutical companies that are deemed oh so traditional, well, they actually have a, a lot of really promising um, talent in, in their organizations now that understand um, the nature of digital therapeutics and, and good teams that can help set that set things up from the, from the beginning. I'm moving forward, and I bet Josh, I bet you have some some good examples of how how like there are ways of partnering with DTX where historically maybe it wasn't as possible as it is, as it is today. Yeah, I, I thanks, Steve. I I think uh, I think we've we've established over the last couple of years that even 170 year old companies can move quickly um, when circumstances demand. Um, I, I I really do think it's it's a question of of what we're talking about. Um, if we're talking about evidence-based, clinically validated interventions, those things take time. Um, and, and candidly, I, I think that that's one thing um, that, that the pharmaceutical uh, manufacturers, the, sort of the incumbents in the space, have invested in, in and ha do quite well. Um, and I, I do think there has been, there, there's been a little bit of a disconnect sometimes between the value that we expect out of these uh, digital tools, um, either on their own or in combination with a, a traditional medicine, um, and the 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 uh, the investment um, appetite. I, I do think you know, I, and, and maybe I'm, I'm just the old guy in the room, but some things take time. Um, you know, you, you need to you, you need time to, to validate. You need time to to generate data, not only regulatory grade data. But also the evidence required of, of effectiveness in the real world that, that's compelling in terms of value for, for payers, whether they're private or public. Um, you know, if, if you can do that overnight, fantastic. Um, what, what we found is that, that, that it, it takes time, it takes structure, um, doesn't, doesn't preclude an organization from being agile um, and from moving with speed. Um, but the, it isn't, uh, and, and, and candidly, I've had the, this challenge even internally in some discussions. The expectation of pace for something digital is so much faster. Um, and I, I try to remind people that we're talking about digital medicines. Um, and comparatively, it, it may be much faster than, say, traditional the development of a traditional molecule. Um, but it isn't, um, it isn't just rolling out a new release of, of an app. Um, it, it could be in certain circumstances, but often it takes a lot more energy um, because there's simply more work to do. Doesn't mean that it, it needs to take 20 years, um, but it, it's certainly it, it's certainly not reasonable to expect in 20 years. Okay, I, I'll be a little more uh, bold on that answer. So, um, yeah, I, I don't buy this whole uh, time frame mismatch. 
uh, to be honest. Um, you know, everybody says they come in, at least at the buyer, a lot of people come in, they say, okay, you know, we're on a, a MVP program. That's, for us, that's a minimum viable product. And for us in pharma, it's also an MVP, but it's a maximally uh, viable product. So, you know, I, I, you know, for me, it's just a difference in the investment return model. Okay, but I think the best partnerships that we have and the best people who come in who are entrepreneurs, they, 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 they focus on synergy. Okay, and they say, hey, look, you know, here, we want to be part of the solution. We want you to be part of the solution, and here's what we want, and here's how we think you can help. Instead of, you know, saying you know, we have a mismatch in time frames, et cetera. And so I, I always ask, you know, all the companies who come in and visit us, I say, what do you want? Okay, have they done their homework? I mean, I, I think that's such a big part of, uh, of this whole thing because there's, there's pieces of our model that can be extremely helpful in terms of advancing these technologies. And those are the this, this discussions I like to have. Uh, so for instance, um, you know, I see a lot of technology companies that uh, could really take advantage of our workflow integration and the way we can create incentives in the system. Okay, that, that, that's all about creating the use case. A lot of people come in, you know, it's a hammer looking for a nail, and they're, they're just looking, you know, what is the kill shot, you know, in this market, and how do we get this adopted, and how do we get uh, either your users or your customers, users uh, being patients and customers being our HCP uh, investment, how, how do you get them into the mix? I mean, the, those, are, those are the really great conversations. So I, I would encourage everybody who thinks about this sector and when they have a, um, something to propose, they come in with, you know, really a great discussion about uh, being part of the solution. I mean, that's, <laughs> I think that would be really helpful. That's uh, incredibly insightful. And, and yeah. I, like, I like the way you're looking at it because you see it as an opportunity, not necessarily walking into discussions trying to figure out where the challenges are to work through. You're looking at it as, come, let's find the synergies and let's build off of that. And I think that's a great way to look yeah, at and, it. Yeah, and whether it's a merger, I, everything, it's all, at the end of the day, it's all about synergy. Because you know we're invested in a marketplace in a certain way, you're invested in, in a marketplace in a certain way. So, you know, how do you put those two together, and basically do it lean, uh, with the right set of resources around it? I mean, that's what it generally comes down to. That's great. Yeah. So, Josh, I want to kind of go back to you real quick, though. You, you started kind of walking down this pathway, and, and just you know, working at Pfizer, being a, a legacy in the in the pharmaceutical um, marketplace. What is it, from your perspective, what role do you see pharmaceutical companies playing in the evolution of digital therapies moving forward? Yeah, I, I, I like Doug's answer. Um, I, I, in particular, it, it's, it's not necessarily a, a pharma versus you know, tech or, or whatnot, but um, rather focusing on, on what we bring to the table. Um, just as, as an organization, and I, it, it's not specific to Pfizer, it could be any large you know, manufacturer. Um, and, and I think part of the opportunity is, is to help, uh, I, I mean, if, if anybody has listened to me for any length of time, they, they know my, my big concern is that we run the risk of being awash in the interesting at, at the expense of the impactful. Um, and, and I think that that's really what uh, I would be looking for in a, in a pharma partner if I had a, a great new idea or a, a potential technology. Um, how do I how do I assess and, and establish the the value and and the the effectiveness, the safety, um, and ultimately the value to, to patients and, and the system at large? Um, and and I think the you know for for you know Pfizer if you. You've done any research at all? You know we've got a singular purpose: it's to deliver breakthroughs that change patients' lives. That's it. There's no mention of small molecule, large molecule tech. You know, the digital therapeutic. It's breakthroughs that change patients' lives. Um, and and I think uh, you know we will if we're not there already, we will rapidly get to the point where we were as as society what 20 years ago, where e-commerce simply became commerce. Um, I believe that we are hopefully on the cusp of digital health simply becoming health and, and, and the absence of uh, a digital component to a particular treatment or treatment journey is more conspicuous, that absence is more conspicuous than, than the presence of, of a digital element. Um, and, and I, you know, so I think uh, as part of the, the system, 
um, I, you know, I, I'm, I think we, uh, we need to, to embrace that and, and uh, you know, look for ways to accelerate um, the integration of, of, of digital components to, to health. They, frankly, it's permeated every other aspect of my life far faster. Um, and uh, so I, I think you know, that the, the role of, of any player in the space is to, to be looking for those opportunities. Um, I think in, in particular, as, a, as now a grizzled veteran of, of big pharma, um, we've got lots of, of expertise um, and experience to bring to the table around, um, you know, how do you produce regulatory grade um, data that, that substantiates not only the effectiveness, but the safety of, of an intervention? Um, how do you demonstrate the, the value of that intervention? Um, you know, I happen to work for an organization that's been doing that for, for, for lifetimes. Um, and so wh why wouldn't we be the first ones you turn to? Um, and regardless of whether you were talking about a, a small molecule, large molecule, or a piece of code. No, that, that's uh, it's an interesting perspective. And I like, uh, I like the way you phrased it. You seem to be very positive and bullish on the, on the digital health pharmaceutical um, you know, strategy, combined strategy. What I would use, let's so maybe I can d just pipe in on what uh, sure. uh, Josh was saying. Exactly, you know, we think similarly. Um, so you know, we can basically bring uh, bring our therapeutic uh, development uh, expertise to the equation. But but what what does that really mean? Okay, and what what does a pharma company really do? What a, it, this is Doug's opinion. Okay, um, but uh, what we really do is we create value that's measurable. That's what a pharma company does. So, what? So, what? What does that mean? Uh, create value. I'll break that down into two pieces. We we create value by creating impact. Impact for patients, putting the patients first, creating impact for the HCPs. That's the value. Okay. Um, in terms of measurability, what we do is um, uh, we have rigor. So we introduce rigor into the process to get uh, measurable, measurable, measurable results that they can basically measure that value that we created. I mean, that's what pharma does. That's what we do in all of these clinical trials, right? We're just capturing this data, we're managing this data, we're ma monitoring this data, and we're saying, here's, here's what it does, right? So I think that's the role that we, uh, we can play. And I think, again, I, you know, having been an entrepreneur and um, been uh, at a big company, I mean, you just got to cherry pick. You just got to go in there and say, what do I need to be successful? Okay, organize the set of resources that you need, figure out what you have, figure out what we have, and just say, hey, you know, here, here's what it means, and then figure out the time frame that you can demonstrate that um, uh, through an ROI. And the demonstration is that whole measurability part. I mean, you know, a lot of people come into us, okay, and the last part of the conversation is, you know, how do how do we how do we how do we demonstrate the ROI? Okay. The better ones come in and they say, especially the ones that are moving out of DTC, moving into the uh, uh, the large employers and the payers and so forth, they come in and they say, you know, here here's how we're gonna demonstrate the value to them. Okay, and here's why we're going to that marketplace. And here's the, here's the, basically the experiment. Here's a product development plan that we need to basically do that, and here's what it's gonna take. So I, you know, just, so I, I think, you know, just to get everybody on the same page, just I think walking in there saying, saying here's my plan, here's the funding and resources I need, here's a part you can play. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and there's this synergy with what you do. Okay, it's, it's not, it, it's a pretty simple outline. But I think if you get there, you're gonna be able to then gather the stakeholders, whether it's in the TA, therapeutic areas or the functions or whoever, to, to, to rally around what you're doing. So you mentioned ROI, Doug, and if I may ask, does the equation that you're using to generate an ROI for a pharmaceutical, does it change when you're looking at it from a digital strategy perspective? Um, yeah, it just depends what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so if it's a, um, a, a DCT or an RPM play, I mean, you're you're basically, you know, that you know that's taking advantage of the decentralization of the technology, right? If you're talking about, as somebody was talking about, um, 
personalization, I think, in the last panel, right? I mean, that whole aspect of self-care and this new layer of healthcare built around the individual that's different from the, um, you know, the cohorts and the, the populations that you're used to looking at. I mean, it's just a different, so it just depends on what, what, your, what your value proposition and what it is. I think going into the uh, employers and the payer markets, I mean, the, the employers are going to be less um, stringent than the payers are in terms of demonstrating the ROI, for sure, for sure. And then for the uh, employers, I mean, they're just trying to show that their members are going to, they're going to benefit Okay, and that um, the employers actually can have a cost save from that, right? But a lot of people come in with these point solutions. I, I've been involved in implementing those through some of our, our, our benefit plans. Complicated, right? Because um, as you layer those onto existing health plans, sometimes there's duplication. Um, and actually, you think like these, these, these health contracts, um, because they're, they're all volume-based, right? So if you actually take volume out of those contracts, the cost goes up. Yeah. So, so you have to really kind of get into the, you know, into the weeds of these things and kind of figure out what they do. But, but, but come, in, come in with, with some measure of ROI, yep. right? That's, that's what I would say. Yeah. If I could quick just piggyback on that, I think that that's yeah. probably our best distinction for digital therapeutics, because just for everyone to, to ground ourselves, digital historically or digital health, didn't necessarily mean impactful measurement and ROI. It might have meant something about awareness, but the opportunity in DTX is, is you know, far more advanced, which then talks back to, to Josh's point about sometimes at least being conscious of what that might mean around time. Um, so I, I thought that was a really good distinction that you made there. Um, yeah, maybe just one other quick point, though, is in terms of how pharma can play a role in defining the success of digital therapeutics, just being mindful of what's going on. I think one of the most exciting areas is mitigating or helping manage side effects. So, you know, one of the more interesting partnerships that happened somewhat recently was, you know, for a multiple sclerosis treatment, um, one, one of the side effects, or not side effects, one of the, the you know, comorbidities or issues that uh, MS patients deal with is depression. Um, so a far, big pharma company had partnered with, you know, uh, something in the behavioral health and um, space around how to manage depression um, and then measure those outcomes. So I think there, there's going to be a really tremendous opportunity moving forward related to uh, management of side effects. And just if we're, you know, talking about terms that might be memorable, you know, how can, how can pharma play in this pill plus era? Um, or, or as Josh mentioned, calling it, you know, a companion earlier too. So there might be a treatment and then a digital companion to it, or sometimes it's, it's actually just the digital therapeutic itself without um, a specific treatment. Yeah, that's actually uh, really interesting because one of the things that we have seen with certain digital therapeutics is the secondary, out, you know, measurement points in the clinical trial can often be unrelated to the actual disease they're treating. And depression's a, a big one that encompasses so many different diseases that, that patients suffer through. So I'm going to ask one last question, and then, and then we'll go to the audience. But, you, you know, Josh, from your perspective, as you're looking at digital um, companies or digital therapeutics out there, do you, is there an internal philosophy where you see digital therapies as only going to be an in-house built platform, or do you also see it as partnering or a combination of both? You know, I, I'd say that, that that chapter is still being written. Um, I, I, I believe what we will see is something akin to how we source um, world-class science, some of it um, in the traditional sense, some of it happens internally, right? We have a, a robust R&D group um, that I'm, I'm fortunate to be a colleague uh, with. And then we also have um, a very robust um, sourcing mechanism for external science um, and even external assets. Um, I don't believe that it will be any different um, in, the, in the digital therapeutic space. I, uh, I suspect we will develop um, some novel therapies that uh, novel digital therapies, much in the way that we do our own um, development of, of large and small molecule. Um, but I also think that you know we will uh, hopefully find ourselves as as a partner of choice 
um, for, for many external partners. And, and those partnerships will come in all shapes and sizes, whether it's uh, just simply a, a co-promote um, opportunity, a co-development opportunity, um, or, or something uh, more significant. Um, uh, you know, I, so I, I, again, I, I think that we're drawing distinctions now that feel profound. Um, but over time, um, the, 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 the way we source advances in digital medicine will be very similar to the way we, uh, we do it with other modalities. Great, thank you. You wanna add on to this? Um, okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you don't have to. Enough no, 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 <laughs> I, I, no, I'm just thinking through a, a good answer. Um, so so there, there are certain digital or technology investments that we just need to make as a corporation to, to have capability, mm -hmm. right? I call that the infrastructure piece, right? Um, and then there's the application layer, and which is more of what I deal with. Um, so when I think about that, you know, like I was saying before, you know, we're not a technology company. You know, we don't know what that investment looks like. I came from a technology company, so I know how they think. Um, but we don't know what the investment, you know, in technology is. We don't know how to make it sustainable. We don't know how big it is, you know, et cetera. We don't know all the trends. So we're just not set up for that kind of investment uh, technology. But um, again, you know, what we are interested in doing is um, taking these ecosystems, these uh, that people were building and building on top of that and then bringing our ecosystem on top of those and then you can create these, these, these shared arrangements where you can be successful together and you typically there's always a technology layer there's always a uh, typically in a lot of these DTXs there's a device layer and then there's a service layer right and so if you really start to unpack that and, and look at the business models together uh, you know there, there, there is uh, there's a pony in that Okay, but you're gonna have you're gonna have to draw it out and just make it clear and bring clarity, high clarity, uh, to that arrangement because um, you know a pharma company is I think what Josh was saying. I mean you know, we sell pills, okay, and a lot of what we're talking about here are, are solutions. Okay, so you really you, you got to really just come in and, and try to be as exact as you can, okay, uh, when you propose. Uh, an arrangement, and you'll see that people are pretty open-minded. People know that the, the puck is moving in different directions. Um, it's just got to do your homework. Great. So, thank you. Yep. Let's uh, let's open it up to the audience now for some questions, please. Any questions? Chris, any uh, virtual questions, maybe? No. no? Oh, there we go. So when is it typically a little too early for a company to come to uh, Bayer or Pfizer? At what stage in their life cycle should they be engaging? Josh, you want to go? I, I was going to say, Doug, that sounds like a PD <laughs> question to me. I, I, I'll, I'll be glad to add some color on top of it, but why don't you get, take the lead? So... Um, so I mean, you know, we transact with people at at all different stages. I mean, you know, so I I get two docs and a uh, walking with a patent that want to get their business going, uh, starting with a sponsored research agreement, and and if it's successful, moving out to an out license. I get um, uh, companies at the seed stage uh, that are looking to, you know, because there's we're in that customer group or there's a technology that's uh, relevant that that makes sense. We, sometimes we. When something's getting up, we um, and we're seeing traction in an area, we we want a front row seat, so we'll invest in companies at that point. Sometimes uh, we invest in companies um, because we want we want alignment with the partner, okay, uh, and that we do a combination uh, development agreement or commercialization agreement um, with that. Sometimes we invest as a prelude to M and A. Uh, sometimes it's just M and A. So I I. I I, I think it's really stage agnostic, and I'd really focus on the value and what what you bring. Sometimes, um, I, I think the stories that don't fly as well is when uh, they're too young and the, the 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 teams that walk in it's a just me situation. 
right? Because then it feels like a little lopsided, right? And you don't really have the, the, the depth in the team to really do what you want to do. Okay, so, so the two things we generally that kick things out would be um, uh, technology obsolescence. So there's technology, there's obsolescence inside your, your plan that why should we take that risk, right? And then the other is management risk, right? So if you if you got somebody who's a rock star scientist, okay, but doesn't really have the the, the clinical development infrastructure around him or the or the uh, the device SAMD experience to do that, then it's just like okay, who's going to do this then, right? So I I think it's just walking in when you're at the point of impact and you feel like you've got you you're ready for a meaty conversation. I mean. Hi, thanks for the oh, thanks for the panel. Uh, really interesting insights. My question was around um, how do you guys view sort of SAMD products that are regulated but not necessarily therapeutic versus digital therapeutic products which are regulated and have a therapeutic outcome? Um, does pharma look at those differently? Are there different cases where you consider one versus the other, or do you kind of for you it's like it, you know? It just matters what the outcome is, and if the outcome is of interest, we'll, we'll engage with it. How, how do you guys think about that? Josh, you're in the lab, so. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'll play. Uh, yeah, I, for us, it's much more the latter. I, so I, what I would say, if the outcome that we're talking about is of interest to us, either as a standalone um, sort of adjacent opportunity or something more tightly coupled to, to something uh, that we're, we're invested in, that, that's what would drive it. Um, I, I think the, the we you know we, we weren't always there right we we started with uh, with a focus on on therapeutics and then I think dramatically uh, well we 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 expanded the aperture considerably um, and started looking at, at all sorts of things whether it was digital diagnostics uh, digital biomarkers um, and 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 continue to to widen the lens. Um, but I, I think it's uh, it, it's so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't draw any hard and fast lines other than it's you, you've got to be related to a to an outcome that we're interested in. Well, thank you. We've got thank you. one from the online audience. Okay, great. Um, so, what do you, what do the panelists see as the bright lights or most successful current examples of external DTX solutions being adopted or added to bio slash pharma? Uh, I'm sorry. What was the question again? What do, what do you see as the bright lights or most successful current examples of external DTX solutions being added to biopharma? DTX. So, um, so I, you know, I, for digital therapeutics, I mean, I, I look at, you know, the whole value chain is the therapeutic, right? And there's digital components along the way. So I'll, I'll just give a, a wider, wider view on that. So I think what I'm seeing is the, where, the hottest spot right now is probably in the drug discovery area. Because I think a lot of these companies are moving from computational R&D platforms to actually real discovery uh, businesses that are cranking out assets. So now you're talking about tech platforms that are also creating assets. So that, that, that's, 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 that's really compelling, right? Because then uh, it's a different kind of discussion, right? It's just um, now you're getting into the core of pharma. Uh, I think the evidence piece is going to take uh, some time, uh, the RWD, RWE stuff, uh, and that's part of the challenge with the digital therapeutics um, because you've got to produce regulatory grade data, okay, and what is that, okay, so everyone's trying to figure out what that is, and then assuming you do create regulatory grade data, you know, will it be accepted? Okay, uh, those are two sort of big risks out there with, you know, on the evidence generation side. Um, on the digital therapeutic side, you know, I know everybody tries to put everything into this bucket of DTX, but, you know, really the market space is, is, is really looking at health and wellness all the way to medical. And people were trying to basically cross that whole chasm and come up with some solution. And sometimes, Sometimes they're consumer-oriented solutions. Sometimes they're regulated solutions. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff in between. So I, 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 I think um, the best thing to do is to say, hey, you know, on, on the, and on the digital therapeutic side, I would say, you know, there's a lot of uh, solutions that are uh, 
data science based and some that are behavioral based. And that's, I think that's another big cut on things. So it just depends on what you're, again, you're proposing. I think uh, what pharma can't do, I'll say that, is the behavioral side, right? I mean, we, because, because the behavioral side, it teaches skills, right? You, know, you take our, our, you know, some of the drugs that we make, they don't teach skills. You just, you can just get better, right? Um, so I, I think that, that ability to build skills, that personalization that somebody was talking about, that one-to-one -one engagement, you know, based on some predictive analytic model, okay? Those are, uh, those are, the, 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 those are the modern product development initiatives that are going to be attractive in the future, right? Thank you. All right. I, think, I think we're out of time now, but um, I encourage you, if you have additional questions, just forward them on the Chris, we'll get them answered. But I walk away from this discussion really learning one very important thing, that there's no formulated process that the pharmaceutical companies are looking at digital health with. Very open-minded, but the key is aligning your solution to the priorities of that organization and going in, being prepared to have a discussion about how you can create synergy and work collectively together. So. Right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to Steve, Doug, and Josh for being on the panel. Very informative. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care.